Hello and welcome to the Brutal Iron Gym Podcast, where our goal is to cut through the BS and deliver the brutal truth about topics related to health and happiness. Today's podcast is number 1357. The topic is training and the title is Programming Elements Most People Mess Up. Now, uh, when creating the title, I thought it was kind of aggressive. <laughs> so I don't know if people are necessarily like messing this up, but it sounded like a good title that people would listen to. Um, it's just five things that I see people uh, don't get a good balance of when you look at the way in which they train or the way they program. And I thought it might be good to kind of cover these and just raise awareness to them. And then if you think that, you know, anything mentioned might be, you know, something that maybe you're missing or maybe you're uncertain if you're doing correct, you can kind of look further into it. So uh, with no further ado, as they say, <laughs> one of the things is people don't often balance uh, having both explosive and controlled elements within their training. And what I mean by this, you can further get an understanding of it in podcast number 220 is a training podcast titled Muscle Intention versus Movement Intention. So that's something you can listen to. And essentially what this means is some exercises we do, we would want to be very slow and controlled to feel the, the targeted muscles stretching and squeezing, stretching and squeezing. And then there's other movements where we want to be very explosive and you're more so guiding a weight, but you're explosive in the movement. There's a lot of momentum involved, and you're guiding the, the path of the weight. What I often find is people either do one or the other. Sometimes there are people that move slow as dirt, <laughs> and they limit how much muscle stress they can actually create because they're moving too damn slow. They need to be more explosive, kind of get some like aggression into their lifts, uh, just get kind of like a, a strength to them. And they need to stop moving so timid. But then you have other people that just throw everything around. And it's like, oh, geez, you know, calm down. You're going to kill yourself. Uh, so there are some exercises that you're supposed to be explosive with. Let's say, for example, um, Olympic lifting. If I'm going to try to do, you know, a, a barbell cleaning press or a snatch, I don't want to I, I don't want to like go super slow and feel every single muscle contracting. That's drive it off the floor. You know, if you get a little bit of hip, you know, hip bump to get some speed, extra speed to it and then drop under it. But you're more so explosive effort and then you're guiding. You guide the bar into the position uh, that you want uh, around the barbell. And then slow things might be like, say, bicep curls. Or if I'm doing like hamstring curls to grow my hamstrings uh, or leg extensions, they should definitely be a little more controlled than what most people do. Uh, but if I want a, sing a specific muscle to be stressed to create um, like kind of a shaping effect or growth effect, I'm going to want to move with what's called muscle intention. My intention is to focus on the muscles. But if I have explosive movements, like say a, a, a deadlift, if you're a power lifter and you're doing a deadlift, you want to have proper technique throughout the movement. You want to know when to flex this muscle and that muscle, but you're basically just driving the bar off the ground and then guiding your body positions around the bar. So you're not trying to feel and squeeze every little individual muscle. You're trying to drive the thing off the floor like crazy uh, so you can try to get the lockout. So too often people do one or the other. I see this a lot in powerlifters that I work with. Uh, so I, I do help people get like um, elite totals and, you know, state records and national like top 50 and stuff like that. So I've trained some really high level people. And I've also helped people from their first ever power to meet. You know, I have a lot of clients. I went from first ever power to meet to elite totals, which is awesome process. And I really love that. And I'm uh, grateful for that opportunity. But oftentimes, powerlifters, if they're explosive people, they'll be explosive in their squat bench deadlift, but then they'll also be explosive in cable rows or, or, or tricep extensions or dips. And it's like, whoa, slow down. So often the accessory lifts, as they're called in powerlifting, are supposed to be performed with muscle intention, but they just blitz right through those, and then they never actually get the full benefit of them. I also then have people who do like bodybuilding, like muscle building or muscle shaping, and they'll move slow as dirt. Everything is so slow that they're like feeling as pump and a squeeze with an eight pound dumbbell. And it's like, what muscle do you think gets damaged or torn up from an eight pound dumbbell? <laughs> None. Uh, so usually eight pound dumbbells would be for like physical therapy, not for actual building muscle tissue. So 
understanding that balance and understanding that there is a balance needed, that you have to have both in your programming, pretty much regardless of any um, like training purpose. You know, if you do strawman, bodybuilding, uh, powerlifting, CrossFit, uh, Highland Games, uh, training as an athlete, uh, I'm sure there's like four million things I'm not saying, but in any category, pretty much, there's going to be times in which uh, in exercises in which you would have slow movement and then some that you would have explosive movement. So understanding that's really important, making sure that you're doing the right type of intentionality to the exercise that you're doing, make sure they're matched well. That's very helpful as well. So that's podcast number 220. You can definitely listen to that. Next thing we have is purposeful but concise warm-ups. Some people don't warm up enough uh, or at all. And some people, they spend an hour working out, like warming up. And then it's like, you know, they're in a gym for two and a half, three hours. And you'll hear them say like, some along the lines of like, oh, the gym is just, you know, it's my life or it's eating up my life. And I'll have people complain like, I can't do powerlifting because I just can't spend three hours a night in the gym. And my answer is, why the hell do you think you have to spend three hours a night in the gym? What are you doing? Like, what the hell are you doing in there for three hours? How the hell is it taking that long? So um, it, there's no need to be in the gym forever. Uh, but there is a need to warm up. You know, so you have the young kids. Like, I own Berlin Gym, and it's an open gym, meaning that people can come and exercise here, even if they're not a client of mine. But you'll see some people, they'll walk in, and they just get right under a barbell and start squatting or get right under a barbell and start benching. And it's like, Oh, don't do that. Like, Oh, <laughs> you just feel bad because there's going to be some tweaks and aches and pains and they're not going to come in with, you know, every muscle group connected to every joint with even tension. You know, there's going to be some tight hip flexors in there. There's going to be some just kind of lazy and weak thoracic spine uh, from person to person. So there's warm ups that are very helpful, especially when you, don't just move to get blood flow, but you move to address very common weaknesses. So the best warm-up routine is actually a title of a podcast we have. <laughs> so podcast 1112, so 1112, 1112 training podcast titled The Best Warm-Up Routine. And it talks about uh, what I do with my clients in my own workouts. Uh, when structuring warm-ups. So I do have a corrective exercise specialist certification uh, and fancy things for just saying, you know, when I do programming, I'm mindful of correcting common weaknesses and or if that individual I'm working with, I'll, I'll correct their specific weaknesses. But often there's something to do with thoracic mobility and thoracic strength. So lower trapezius strength in that area. And maybe over tight, you know, chest muscles, but in general, the uh, posture and thoracic health of most people is not optimal. So we do kind of address that in our warm-ups. Most people can use more core strength, so we address that. And most people can use more hip mobility because they don't have the greatest hip mobility and we don't really use our hips to full range of motion in regular life. So all the warm-ups I do for clients in some way do address uh, thoracic mobility, core strength, and hip mobility. Now, I, I blend it in very different ways depending on the person I'm working with, but those elements are in there. Uh, so that's something that I would highly recommend everyone do. Now, that whole routine, uh, if you do it in the most basic way explained in the podcast, it would maybe take 8 to 12 minutes. That's it. You shouldn't be doing, you know, warm-ups that last over 15 minutes or so unless it's like you're doing some kind of physical therapy, rehab type stuff, or there's some kind of special situation to it. In general, warm-up routines and getting yourself up and moving should be like kind of 10 minutes or less. It should be enough to, to have the purpose to it, but not so much that you zap yourself of all energy and motivation before you actually start into your actual workout. So that's the second thing that people need to kind of improve upon is having more purposeful but concise uh, kind of warm-ups. Now, purposeful and concise probably mean similar things, but the, the reason why I want to word it that way is, is uh, you can have a purpose to everything you're doing, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's concise. A lot of times I'll see people, they have like 12 things they do as a warm-up routine, and four of them do the same damn thing. And it's like, what are you doing? Why do you need four of those things? Don't do that. <laughs> so we want to have purpose to what we're doing, but we also want to be concise and, and kind of the, the least effective dose or whatever the heck that terminology would be. Third thing we're looking at here is exercise, um, and what it comes down to is kind of like exercise selection. 
understanding the perceived purpose versus the real effect. Meaning people will often do something and I would ask like, what are you doing that for? And then they answer with something completely different than what that exercise is going to give them. So um, like one example, somebody's doing, you know, eight pound dumbbells for skull crushers. And I'll be like, you know, hey, what are you doing that for? And they're like, oh, I want to get my tricep stronger for bench press. So they're doing eight pound skull crushers for like, say, 10 to 14 reps. And it's like, oh, my gosh, that's way too light to be useful. And it's way too high reps for like a strength effect. So you're not even like that's more like muscle building, muscle damaging ranges. But eight pounds isn't heavy enough to actually damage them. So they don't need to be in such an isolated position as a skull crusher. Go over to, you know, like a assisted dip machine and do it dips. That's going to put way more weight load into their triceps. And they can do, you know, heavy sets of like, say, three to five or four to six. And that actually translates over to strength. So sometimes people will do something that they believe is going to get them something, but the somethings don't match. <laughs> so that's very important to understand, very important to recognize if we're making any of those mistakes. Podcast 214, so way back when, Podcast 214 is a training podcast titled Understanding Rep Ranges and Expected Results. So that's very helpful, so that way you know if the rep range you're doing of an exercise is going to get the result you want. And then Podcast 433 and 437 are trainer education podcasts. So I used to do those, uh, uh, and then I just realized I don't have to write trainer education because my trainers that I work with, um, over half my clients are personal trainers, actually. So they were listening to all the podcasts anyhow, so I didn't need to specify which one was learning opportunities for them. So we just kind of switched over to this now, the cycle we have now of like uh, nutrition, training, mindset, and Q&A, and then they can learn from all of them. <laughs> but podcast 433, and podcast 437 are both titled Trainer Education Exercise Selection. There's just part one and part two. So those are going to be great to help you understand um, to a greater degree if what you're doing is getting you what you actually think it's getting you. Fourth thing we have is how hard to push yourself in your workouts. Some people push way too damn hard. They bury their body. Then they wonder why they feel like crap and their joints hurt. Other people don't push themselves hard enough and they wonder why they go to the gym all the time, they eat healthy, but nothing ever changes. So having the proper workout intensity is extremely important. Podcast 110, so an infinite number of podcasts ago, <laughs> podcast 110 is a training podcast titled Training Volume Homework Analogy. And that's a great one. I even had just one of my online clients recently uh, write to me. He listens to podcasts when he can, and then will sometimes write back like what he learned from them or like an outline of different things he took away. And this is one he listened to recently. And he's like, I really like this. It really made a lot of sense to me. So I thought I'd throw it out there in today's podcast. But when we look at like how much workout to do, like how many exercises, how long should I work out? And then what the intensity is, it's kind of balancing homework in the sense that if I gave a student one homework problem, say they're try trying to learn math, and I was like, go home and solve, you know, four plus six, and that's it. That's the only problem I gave them. Okay, well, they, they, they did math, but, but it's not really enough volume of practice to really build the skill, right? But if I send them home with 1,000 problems to do t by tomorrow, ridiculous. They can't do all that. That's absurd. So our workouts should be similar. It should be enough to create some stress and challenge to the body that the body says, oh, geez, you know, I don't really like that. Like, whew, I struggled to keep up with that. I might want to get a little bit stronger. I might want to build more muscle. You know, whatever your training stimulus might be. But you train hard enough that the body thinks it needs to adapt to that stimulus. But not so insanely hard that your body gets the crap beat out of it and it can't possibly adapt all the way. So that's very helpful to understand as well, is am I doing enough in my training or too much? Am I pushing myself hard enough or not hard enough? The last thing we want to look at is balancing complexity and simplicity in our training. Now that's a, kind of a weird kind of thought here, but too often people get into too narrowed scopes. 
So if you're a bodybuilder, you're just going to do, you know, walk in the gym, do some chest flies in 8 to 12 reps, do dumbbell chest press, 8 to 12 reps, chest machine press, 8 to 12 reps. And it's just all these things that are just, it's just a machine, three sets, 8 to 12. A machine, three sets, 8 to 12. And then you have people who have, like, they think, okay, I'm going to do a reverse band elevated with chains on with isometric pauses deadlift. And you're like, what? <laughs> what the hell did you just say? <laughs> so it's way too complex. It takes them a half hour to set the damn thing up. They do two or three sets with 17 minutes rest in between. And then they wonder why they're in the gym for three hours. So there's simplicity to what we do. And then there's complexity. And we need to find that balance. So one of the things that I like, I've heard recently, and in general context, I like this. It doesn't always apply to everybody, but I generally like the idea of, in our training, we should do something like once a week or so, once or twice a week, that's kind of like a squatting movement, where you have to bend your knees quite a bit. So you have to bend your knees and kind of squat yourself up and down. Then you have something that's a deadlift, where you have to kind of hinge at your hips. Then we have something that we pull towards us, whether that's pulling from overhead down to us or out in front of us towards us. And then we have to push something away from us, pushing it overhead or pushing it away from us. And then we have some type of kind of what looks like manual uh, labor <laughs> is carrying something, dragging something, maybe doing some bodyweight jumps. Uh, we just want to do some things that kind of get us moving around in weird positions, weird angles, get a little bit of muscle burn, a little bit of aerobic burn, like lung burn. Just We want to have a balance and complexity to our training, to where we're doing squats, deadlifts, pulls, pushes, carries, drags, jumps. You know, we're kind of like using our body in multiple angles, multiple ways. It doesn't have to be anything super special. The idea is to kind of just make it fun and make it easy. So, for example, in our gym, we have a rack of kettlebells. Uh, so I would just pick up one kettlebell in one hand, one kettlebell in the other hand. I'd walk it to the other side of the gym, bring it back and set it on the rack. And then I did five uh, squat jumps. And then I would carry the next set of kettlebells a little bit heavier, carry it to the other side of the gym, carry it back, do another five bodyweight squat jumps. And I just did like five, six rounds of that. And that's it. It took five, six minutes. I then went on and did the rest of my workout, which yesterday was some chest work and a little bit of upper back. Uh, but it's just something that gets me, it works a little bit of grip strength. Uh, it actually loosens and stretches some tight muscles in my forearms and elbows, which is actually really good for just kind of joint therapy. It also works on like core stability. Uh, the jumps are working on uh, just like athleticism and how co coordinated I feel with my body. So at 280 pounds, if I don't pay attention to moving myself well, um, you know, it would be kind of feeling laborsome to get down on my knees to do something, or if I'm helping my dad, you know, out in the yard, you know, jumping up onto the truck, jumping back down from the truck, you know, just, I want to be able to move confidently and without hesitation or without like a joint annoyance or having to work around a certain position rather than just being able to go through the position. So it's helpful for pretty much everybody to have some degree of balance of those elements. And the idea is, no matter what your goal, you want to be functional as an, an older adult. So when you get into your 60s, 70s, 80s, you want to be able to move around and kind of be kind of independent. That's going to come from what you do in your 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. So why not, why, why not work on some of that stuff now, build the base that you can have then, now, like the muscle tissue you'll want to carry with you as you get older, the joint strength and joint stability that you want to carry with you when, as you get older. So building in complexity into your training so you have movements like squat, deadlift, pull, push, carry, jump, drag. But make it simple. You don't have to spend, you know, 17 hours setting all that stuff up. It can just be some bodyweight jumps. It can just be, you know, carry some 45-pound plates around in odd positions. Just move around. Just get yourself into some weird positions every now and then. Make your muscles burn. Make your lungs burn. Just get a little more uh, complexity to your training rather than just this narrow scoped of, you know, always doing bodybuilder-type movements or always doing powerlifting-style movements. Get out there a little bit and do some other odds and ends. So those are five elements that I think everybody can... Uh, probably include uh, improve in some way in their training. Uh, so I just want to throw those out there, uh, tell you all those different podcast resources so that we can check them out if you want to uh, dive deeper into it. Hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully it was interesting. If you have any questions, just email me at brutalironjim at gmail.com. 
If you like today's podcast, please consider sharing the podcast. The more people we share it with, the more people we can help. Sharing it on social media does reach the most people, but even in just a conversation with a fa- friend or so, that can be great as well. The more people we share the podcast with, the more people we can help. Thank you to the patrons of the podcast, the people who financially support the podcast, which you can now do on our website. We have uh, availability to do a one-time donation, monthly donation, or yearly donation. The podcast is well over $1,000 a year for hosting costs. I give an hour to it every single day, and we want to keep it for free. And I would like to keep it without like 4,000 ads in the way of everything to try to earn some money. Uh, But I appreciate the people who do give financial help. It's the only way that this makes any sense to do every day and keep it for free. So I really appreciate everybody. Thank you very, very much. If you like the information we share in our podcast, you can find more from us on our social media channels on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube under the name Brutal Iron Gym. If you have any questions, feedback, suggestions, anything that you want to know, let us know at our email, brutalirongym at gmail.com. As always, I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.